All right, let's do it. Our NFL Eagles insider, John McMullen, joins me every night at 7.30. Follow John on Twitter at jfmcmullen, phillyvoice.com, si.com, and host of Extending the Play every Saturday, 10 a.m. All right, let's bring John into the conversation now and talk some Eagles, baby, and see what John has going on. John, how are we doing tonight, my friend? Doing well. We got the music. How about that? Yeah, B. Hey, listen, it's uh, setting us up for big expectations here tonight, so we got to bring it. <laughs> I'm not sure I can live up to those expectations, but it is Ric Flair's birthday as well. So we'll try. How old is Ric Flair? Uh, he's getting up there. I don't know exactly. In the 70s, though. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Has to be, you know, mid seventies. But uh all right, so is this do you have a new article up on SI dot com, John? I do. It was about Frank Reich uh talking today in Indianapolis. Typically, you know, this time of year is the scouting combine. So you have that's one of those times every year where the head coach and The GM has to talk, (laughs) Um, but as is always, it seems, in this never-ending pandemic, everything changes, no combine. So technically, I mean, coaches around the league, certainly the coach here is not speaking. (laughs) Um, So, But Frank Reich uh, spoke to the Indianapolis media today, via Zoom, obviously, but it's kind of interesting because – They traded for Carson Wentz, as we all know, but they can't talk about it yet because even though everybody knows it, uh, you can't actually uh, process these trades until March 17th, the first day of the new league year. So it was interesting to see Frank kind of tap dance. He couldn't talk about the player, but he talked about the player. Actually did a good job. Yeah, and, you know, of course, everyone – understands why Indy was such a a destination that Wentz, I'm sure, had circled uh, in Sharpie, permanent ink, and that was the only place he really wanted to go. Uh, So now he's reunited with Frank Reich, and we've talked about this before, just with, you know, that team. That team's won, coming off a season where they've won 11 games, a nice run game, uh, you know, arguably the best offensive line in the league, at least last year, I would say. Right, John? Top two or three? Yeah, they're up there. And obviously, I, I mean, Quentin Nelson is arguably the best offensive line in football. He's their left guard. But it's interesting, Anthony Costanzo uh, is retiring. So they do have a hole at a pretty significant position. And they have even talked about uh, moving Quentin Nelson outside to play left tackle. That's how highly regarded he is Uh, ultimately i I don't think they're going to go that route i don't know why you would want to upset that apple cart uh so to speak and we'll see how they handle it i I mean first they have you know they gave up draft capital obviously to get carson Wentz. so um the most notable name out there is probably orlando brown because he wants to play left tackle Um, the great right tackle for the Baltimore Ravens was forced to play left tackle when Ronnie Stanley went down with an injury. Um, but you know, Ronnie Stanley's arguably the best left tackle in football when he's healthy. So, um, Brown would kick back to right tackle. Doesn't want to do that. Wants to be traded. So I would think that's the first name they would want to look at. Uh, but that's easier said than done because a lot of people are going to look at Orlando Brown. What What is Frank Wright going to do that the Eagles weren't able to do? And, and you know, besides the obvious factors of having healthy players and a very strong offensive line, besides those things, what are the tangibles, what game planning, what communication, whatever it may be, what separates him that makes everyone feel like, at least in the Wentz camp, that he's going to get back to, you know, elite level or even just normal level? 
Well, I, and I think he, that's kind of some of the stuff he talked about today. I, I do think he understands what made Carson successful early in his career because um, he he was there, ground floor. And, you know, I was there, ground floor, to listen to Frank Reich talk about Carson ground floor. So um, he, he knows he came in with some um, – mechanical issues, some fundamental issues coming from North Dakota State, and they really, really worked them hard in that aspect of it. And we all know the history by his sophomore season. He was an MVP candidate. So he was really headed in the right direction. And then Frank left and and John DiFilippo left. In a lot of ways, I I mean, I think John was more important to Carson Wentz than than Frank or Doug um, because he was the guy working with them every single day and he was the so-called hard uh hard ass that uh really just never let up on him and Carson didn't like him uh didn't like that you know he was sort of the bad cop Doug was the good cop and and Frank was the in between um and I think he's going to try to set that up uh in Indianapolis um, and we'll see if it works. Um, but Scott uh, Milenovich is who's an ex head coach and kind of ex quarterback. He's the quarterbacks coach now. Um, so we'll see if he has that same effect. I, I think the quarterback coach is the most important, um, most important part of it for Indianapolis. I really do. I want to ask you about. Um your other article on Philly voice. But before we do that, uh, just fill the listeners in for those who maybe don't know, or may have missed it. The uh, Jersey number situation with Carson. Uh, We'll see. I I mean, Michael Pittman doesn't want to give it up. I, I, yeah, I I don't know if Carson wants 11 or doesn't want to, or doesn't care. And sometimes when you do change um, teams, you do want a new start, and you do want uh, a new jersey number. Some of the more um, financially um, uh, smart players, I mean, it happens in the NBA. We've seen it with, you know, Michael Kobe uh, on the same team. I mean, they want to change numbers on purpose to sell more merchandise. So um, sometimes uh, you don't have a problem with it, but – I, I, you know, if Carson wants 11, Michael Pittman should get the hell out of the way. I will say that. But Michael Pittman claims he's not giving it up. And we'll see if, if Carson pushes. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't ultimately, I don't think he, he wants to, because obviously that would be a bad foot to get off on. But I, I, I do think if I were. Chris Ballard or, or Frank Reich, I, I would take Michael Pittman to the side and say, you know, shut the hell up. And quarterback <laughs> is is going to get his number. And maybe he doesn't want the number, as I said. But, uh, I mean, you know, that's a second-year player coming off a rookie season where I think he had one touchdown. And, you know, it's second-round pig. He's high ceiling. And then the second part of it for Michael, who's going to throw you the football, dude? Make the guy happy. Exactly. Doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. So I I heard uh, on another radio station that I was listening to for a few minutes earlier that Carson Wentz is going to wear number one. Uh, Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know if that news broke. Uh, If that's official, uh, I do know he kind of intimated that he doesn't care and maybe he does want to change and maybe that's what he's decided. But if he's deciding that, uh, you know, you're taking obviously one, one away. If you're deciding it because Michael Pitt <laughs> doesn't want to give you 11, I think the cult should nip that in the bud. I got to be honest. Yeah, they should. But, uh, you know, that's just the beginning, man. Let's see, uh, you know, the drama. What number will Carson wear? No. Um, all right. So let's get to uh, your not article. Wearing eighteen, I can tell you that. No. <laughs> no, certainly not. Um, that's for one Peyton Manning. All right. Let's get to uh, your article over at phillyvoice.com. John, another good one. 
Uh, yeah, well, thank you. But um, <laughs> it was just kind of closing the door on uh, the locker room and all that angst and uh, all those stories and all that. A lot of gossip, to be honest, uh, about Carson Wentz in the locker room. We talked about it a little bit and his personality. Um, and Chris Long and Malcolm Jenkins talking about it on Chris's podcast. And I think they cleared a lot of things up, but I I do think the one thing that Chris and and Malcolm didn't take into account is, you know, their status and, and the fact that, you know, veteran players, leaders, everybody looks up to them. Um, they're on a different level and like a rookie or a, or a first year guy or a young player who, you know, is trying to find his way. And it, it, they look to the quarterback, those types of players as, you know, the leader of the football team, everybody does in every city. And that's where I think Carson had difficulty with because he is, um, I don't want to say shy, but I, I use the term introverted and uh, a lot of people take that the wrong way. Uh, you know, all the times, and last year, obviously, we were not in uh, the locker room at all, but I was in the locker room a lot with Carson. He didn't spend a lot of time in there. Now, in the open locker room period when the media is allowed in there, uh, there's a lot of guys who don't want to be in there um, because they don't want to deal with the media. Um but, again, as a quarterback, there's certain guys, and we all know their names, and the Brandon Grahams of the world, the Jason Kelseys, Lane Johnsons, Malcolm Jenkins when he was here, on and on and on. They would just hold court, you know, and they were just comfortable with it. And Carson certainly wasn't comfortable with it. Certainly, I, I don't, you know, from what everyone said, and Chris and, and Malcolm admitted it, and what we've been talking about for years is, you know, he's not that guy. He's not that guy that's going to go around the locker room and 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 shoot the you know what with everybody. And that can, you know, perception, Ryan, is greater than reality often. And I think that pretty much is um, the starting point for every piece of negative information that you've ever heard about Carson Wentz. And it just basically comes down to people expect quarterbacks to have certain personalities and he didn't have that type of personality. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but you know, there's, it can create some issues and it did create some issues. Uh, This week we've talked a lot about what the Eagles could do at number six, dove into the options uh, for the draft and wide receiver and quarterback, I, I, I want your thoughts a little bit on the other North Dakota State quarterback, Trey Lance. Well, first of all, I, I, I use that old scout adage, you, you never scout the helmet. So those people saying, you can't take another kid from North Dakota State. Uh, Trey Lance has nothing to do with Carson Wentz and vice versa. Uh, they're not the same guy. They're not the same player. Um, you know, I look at any other major college. Uh, you know, obviously North Dakota State at a lower level of football. But if you think about, and, and I always say, look at Alabama. Look at Jalen Hurts and Tua on the same exact team. I mean, they're not the same player. They're not. It, uh, it's it's so obvious, but so many people have difficulties overcoming that hurdle uh, and blaming or or assuming in a good sense that because uh, we just talked about Quentin Nelson and Ronnie Stanley. I mean, those are Notre Dame guys, arguably the best left tackle in football, the best left guard in football. Uh, um, you you want to throw Zach Martin in there, maybe the best right guard in football. They're all Notre Dame guys, but it doesn't mean every single Notre Dame offensive lineman is going to be a star. Uh, and, and that's kind of the thing that happens with quarterbacks, whether it's good or bad. You know, certain Carson Wentz 
failed, and, and by the way, I think he didn't fail. There were just obviously some really highs and some bad lows, and it didn't last as long. But ultimately, if you look back, you would have to say it was a success overall because the Eagles got a Super Bowl championship out of it, uh, and he was a big part of it. But we're not going to relitigate that. My my point is. You can't just dismiss the kid because he comes from North Dakota State or you're going to make a mistake. Um, He is a tough evaluation because, similar to Carson, I mean, the biggest issue playing there is you don't play a a lot of high-level competition. And he is similar to Carson in the fact that he didn't play a lot. You know, when Carson was injuries, didn't have a ton of starts, with Trey, he didn't have a ton of starts, obviously, the pandemic. <clears throat> so you're, you're kind of flying blind. I think he had 19 maybe starts. Um, you know, you know he's tremendous athletically, but that's the easy part. The difficult part is can he process quickly? Can he learn the offense? Can he do those types of things? And that's what the Eagles have to do with all the quarterbacks but the two most likely to be available at six uh, are Lance and and perhaps Justin Fields. Those are the two they're going to hone in on. And, hey, that's what the pre-draft process is before. you got to figure out what these quarterbacks can do and if they're worthy of that selection. Is Trey Lance worthy of that selection? Because it feels like the other three are. He's maybe on the fence, or am I off base with that? Uh, no, I, I, I think ultimately all three, the top three, you know, Lawrence is going number one. Zach Wilson's probably going number two. It's just a matter of the, the Jets or if somebody trades in and they trade out to get Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson. Um, and, and then you talk about Fields and Lance. And Fields has been taking kind of some hits recently because of his processing and the fact that you know, he he never came off his first read at Ohio State, basically, because he never had to. So Max Jones is facing some of those similar situations in Alabama. Um, and, and it seems like Lance, if anything, is, is, is getting a, a little bit of wind behind his sails because um, there's a little bit of unknown and, and people are, are defaulting to his um, – his traits and his athleticism. And that's sort of how this stuff works, but it, you know, it really doesn't matter about draft Twitter or all the draft experts. It matters what NFL teams think. And just from understanding NFL teams, generally quarterbacks get pushed up the board, not pushed down the board. And especially when you have quarterbacks going one, two, as I expect you're going to have, then people start to get a little panicky. Now, and see, you know, you look at the Jared Goff, Carson Wentz at the year, you didn't have another option. This year you have another option. So I think those two guys are going to get pushed up the board, not down the board. Did you see Mel Kuyper lose his you-know-what? Uh, I think it was this morning. <laughs> I heard Mel did a. All I heard was Mel did want a mock draft and he had some trades in it, which I always respected, obviously. And, and you know, this new brand, your, your trades are dumb. Oh, you tra- your trades are dumb. Uh, nobody has any idea about trades. So I always respected Mel for saying, you know what, that's nonsense. Um, you know, mock drafts are what they are. They're nonsense, too, to be honest, but you have to do them. So you just, you know, kind of do the best players or um, try to figure out the needs of each team and do it that way. Uh, so I heard he put trades and everybody was mocking him that he finally put trades and finally came into the. Uh, well, that, that wasn't, you know. wasn't uh, what I was referring to. At least they were talking on get up about, um, about Justin Fields. And I forget, it was a new analyst who I haven't really seen on there before. I forget who it was. But he was saying, 
you know, Justin Fields doesn't go through his progressions and he needs to anticipate where his receivers will be more. And Mel Kuyper lost it. He said, listen, he's like, I heard the same things about Josh Allen. I heard the same things about Justin Herbert. It's a scout's job to project. Scouts are critiquing fields about what they should be doing and they're not doing. If they have to see it, then they're not a scout that I want. Scouts have to scout with anticipation, just like the quarterbacks have to do when they're throwing it. Yeah, you're right. He's a hundred percent right. And that's what I'm saying. It, 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 draft Twitter doesn't matter. So they're kind of the ones saying he doesn't go past this first progression, which, by the way, is not incorrect. He doesn't because he doesn't have to. But scouts have a more difficult job, and that's why scouts are more important because they do have to evaluate and they do have to project. And that's the trick. The trick is not to watch film and watch highlights and say, wow, he looks great. Yeah, of course, Mac Jones looks great. Look who's throwing the football to. Look at the offensive line. Look at everything in Alabama. So, it, it, in a lot of ways, it becomes trickier for for players that are on great teams like that because they have great supporting cast. Obviously, they're going to look great. How does it project when things are more even as they will be in the NFL? And on the other hand, you have somebody like Trey Lance. Um, who played at a lower level, uh, and again, not against high level competition. And that's, yeah, that, I mean, that's the trick. That's why it's a difficult thing to do, uh, to draft NFL players because so many things come into it and, and a lot of things, even more can knock things off the rails. And we just saw it with Carson Wentz. I mean, obviously you saw a player, uh, at at the apex in 2017 and fall, you know, basically not to the floor, through the floor to the basement in 2020. That's how quickly things can change. So it's not easy to do. And yeah, people say Justin Fields. What do you expect Justin Fields to do? That's, right, not hit the I'm open man. If a guy is open, right. what what do you expect him to do? Oh, I'm not going to throw it to him to prove to you I can go to my third read. Right. What is it? I, it doesn't make any sense. That's because the people that are uh, bringing that up, they don't know what they're talking about, and they think they want to <laughs> act like they do. Well, yeah, I mean that's part of it. Right. There's a lot of really good, you know. There's a lot of really good. Uh, draft people on on Twitter. So, I, sure. I mean, it depends on the person, obviously. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good ones, and a lot of them are former scouts, and they know how to do it. And, you know, I, I if you do like that kind of stuff, I would just research the actual people that you're listening to. And if they have a background and, and they have a history, um, you know, put a little more weight to it. But, yeah, if somebody can't realize something as simple as that, Again, you're not <laughs> – if if your first read is open, it's your job to get the football to them. Simple as that. So, yeah, I, I mean, Justin Fields rarely had to come off his first read, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to project him moving forward because he will have to do that in the pros. And that's the hard part. Can he do it? That's what scouts are there for. To project. All right, last one here for you, John. Let's um, step away from the Eagles and the draft talk. Russell Wilson, uh, what's the latest there? Do you think there's a chance now that Russell Wilson is going to be out of Seattle? Yeah, I mean, there's a chance. I, I Man, it is the year of the disgruntled quarterback. It really is. Uh, I mean, does anybody have a good relationship with their quarterback? Uh, I mean, it is unbelievable. So, it, you know, obviously, I, I, don't, I don't think Seattle uh, wants to trade him. But this is one of those situations where they're starting to leak information. They're starting to fight back and saying, uh, you know, this is getting a little out of hand. And, and they're starting to uh, to push some things. And he, he wants say in personnel, which is kind of ludicrous, i got to be honest. Uh, that's that's not going to work out well. Um, 
and he says he wants to stay, but he also had his agent list the four teams he would go to um, because he has a no trade clause. Uh, it's it's getting ugly, um, and and there's you know in a lot of ways I think Joe Douglas and the New York Jets they're the key to all of this because they're the one team that has the the wherewithal from uh, the draft picks, the money available to go out and get Russell Wilson or Deshaun Watson if their teams are willing to trade them. Um, or they could just stick with the young kid and, and take Zach Wilson, go that way. Uh, they're the, the crux to it all, I think, the New York Jets. That's scary, uh, but we'll keep an eye on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, John, appreciate it, man. John joins me every night right here on The Fix at 7.30, talking Eagles and all the latest news and notes in the NFL. Be sure to follow John on Twitter at JFMcMullen, phillyvoice.com, si.com, and host of Extending the Play, Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 11, right here on 1490. All right, John, go uh, catch some of that Sixers game or, you know, Watch Luca. paint. Watch paint dry. Yeah, either one. Luca, baby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Ryan. There he is, Johnny Mac. The, 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 middle. the middle. I'm out on fishing in areas like. Come on, bro. The- you have. You're about to have a kid, and he's gonna want to go fishing. Uncle B can't take him fishing all the time. You gotta learn to fish, bro. It's a good point. What do you mean it's a good point? Him. My ability to father my child relies solely on taking him fishing? Yes, well, Mr. Predicto. All right, what's the question for Mr. Predicto here? About your ability to father a child. <laughs> well, it has to be yes or no, okay? Will your son want to go fishing? Will my son, my boy, want to fish? Uh-oh. The signs say no. Huh? Oh, that's it. I'm walking off the set like Maury. Boom, boom. I'm out. Drop the mic. See ya. You're not capable of dropping the mic. Oh, my goodness. I'll yeah. roll with that Mr. Predict. This is my guy right here. The Middle with Aton Shander, Barrett Brooks, and Harry Mays. Weekdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern.